Time. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. Great to see you, everybody. Happy Friday night. Fooling around with the different streams, trying to get some light going in here. Happy Friday. Cheers, my dears. Hope you are doing well on this Friday night. We're getting some wacky weather. I got a report from my buddy Rebecca in Colorado that it is very cold there and she's wearing a sweater. And for us, it's been very hot and I've got the fan going again. Who knows what is going on? Except that it's Friday and we are back together. I've got a great episode tonight. Um, I was trying to decide what to do with tonight because it is October and I am about to launch into our creepy, spooky conversations about witches and monsters and patterns that have to do with Halloween and heading into the holidays. Uh, but for tonight, I thought let's look and catch up on some of the patterns that I've been seeing coming to auction specifically with an auction house called Pook and Pook in Pennsylvania really, really strong on the folk art side and lots of beautiful rugs have been changing hands in the last couple of weeks. So I thought, let's put our thumb down on that and figure that out before um, we lose track of everything that's coming and going. There's some important rugs that have been moving. I thought, let's do that tonight and then we'll move on to our spooky segments a little bit later in the month. Kaz, it's great to see you. Happy Friday in Wisconsin. Stephanie, greetings in Arizona. Linda in Massachusetts, great to see you. Ryan says, board game night ended just in time to tune in. Thank goodness for that. That is important. I'm glad that you're there in North Texas. Um, having a hard seltzer, very nice. I'm having a glass of wine and this festive cup from TJ Maxx. My buddy from Texas just called me a little while ago, another friend from Texas. She called from the line at McDonald's because if you're friends with me on Facebook, you know that this has been a week fraught with searching for those limited edition cactus flea market, whatever boxes, adult Happy Meals. Um, the kids are driving me crazy with them and she was in line at a Texas McDonald where they were in stock. So she bought a whole ton of them and she opened them all up and they were all grimace, but it's better than nothing. Um, but it's just funny that in different areas, I guess it's less of a thing here. It is a very, very big thing. Mom, good to see you and I'll see you again tomorrow. We're having an exciting weekend because remember this coming weekend, I'm teaching, if you're local, I'm teaching in Madison tomorrow at Madison Wool. Yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, and that's gonna be the pumpkin sugar skull. So that's happening tomorrow afternoon. And, uh, and then on Sunday, We'll be going, my mom and I and whoever else is local, going to New Britain, to the Art Museum in New Britain. I think it's called the Art Gallery Art Museum. Uh, to see Pierre Sylvain's talk. He does a lot. If you are in our Facebook group, which is Row Cooking and Punch Needle Club, he does so much. He works in so many different mediums from like stained glass to hooked. He does a lot of hooked drugs. Really beautiful work. So we'll be going on Sunday to that. And I will document that and photograph it and bring that in for you on Monday. So you'll feel like you were there too. But that is going to be a lot of fun. Lots of things on the horizon. Ryan, were you playing Bonkers? That is one of our favorite games. We still have that game from when we were little. There's a bunch of games that we never let go of, like Magnificent Race, Bonkers, Careers, of course, Life and Clue and all those, but Bonkers was fantastic. That's the one that had those little half moon things, right? Like the little lamb's tongue things in it that you put on the sides of the path, I think. Oh man, what a lot of fun. Wendy, great to see you. Happy Friday. I hope the game went well last Friday. I forgot to ask you. Karen, great to see you. Cold and foggy. Homemade beef stew, glass of red wine. Sounds perfect. This is a cozy night for sure. Thank you. The light got going again. We were suffering from poor lighting in here, but that is now fixed with a big light umbrella. Oh, if you could only see, if you could only see right there. Oh man. Kirsten, cheers, my dears. Great to see you. Happy Friday. Cheers, my dears. Linda Ann, Linda B. All the buddies are logging on. Lily, great to see you. Sonia in, in San for us. San St. Francisville, Louisiana. <laughs> How many times can I screw up? I have had one sip of this and you saw that. Greeting Sonia in St. Francisville, Louisiana. I got it. I got it. I was making it much more difficult than it was. Great to see you. SF Stark, great to see you. Happy Friday night. K, happy Friday night. Great to see you. Greetings, Atha K. Any Atha questions, we are directing straight to you. And I have not looked at the latest issue of um, Atha live yet, but I must because it is a fantastic issue. That is on the horizon for Coffee Time this coming week. Oh, Cindy, great to see you and Robin. Oh, good. It is Friday night for sure. Whitney, great to see you. Dave, there you are. Dave, I hope you caught a, a rerun of the 
show from yesterday on the Toronto graffiti, all of the laneways. That was so you. I was thinking of you through that entire episode. Yes, the, the track cards. Okay, I thought so. Super groovy artwork in Bonkers. That was one of our favorite ones. We went nuts with that game, I'll tell you. What a lot of fun. Retro gaming. Okay, let's do this first before I completely lose track of the evening. Now, what day is today? Let's have our horrible Halloween joke from the Halloween advent calendar. Let's see, it's seven. Oh man, what are the, there we go. I was gonna say, what are the chances of me finding door number seven? Oh, is that cute? Look at this. Design ideas, simple design ideas. You see that little spider? That's what we got today. Um, what is a spider's favorite day? I'm not even gonna pause and give you time for this because it's not worth it. Fly day, fly day. Dave, you did see it. Oh, I knew. I know you're. I know you love doing tours around there. I knew that you would love that. Fantastic, Whitney. Happy Friday. I hope I am feeling a little bit better. I am warm. Oh, we're going to the gym four days, two hours each day, but it's paying off now. Relaxing with you. I didn't go today. I was not. I was not feeling well this morning. Physically, I was fine. Mentally, it was a little bit of this. So I just did not trust myself to do stepping. You know. Because, I mean, if you wipe out while you're stepping, then everybody in the room is going to be shouting out, oh, my God, are you okay? And then you have to shout back, shut up, and pretend you did not see me. M mind your own business? But of course not. But it's so embarrassing. So I didn't, I didn't go today. You are putting me to shame. Congrats, but make sure you're resting, too, getting that yin and the yang, right? And happy Friday. Great to see you. I want to get started. I have limited energy these days, and I have a huge show. So let's do a little sip. One more. Cheers, my dears. Agenia, great to see you. Happy Friday. You know, I don't know why I just thought of that, but I finally finished this. Finally, I worked on it for one day. I just blocked him a minute ago, the little sheep, right? So this pattern is up. This is a good, easy pattern, mug rug size. It's not, it's not big at all. It's quite small, but it's like, I think it's 55, something like that, with all this wool that I dyed myself, 10 by 8. So that's a good size. That's a good beginner size or a good uh, mug rug size. The colors are never good on the monitor in any weather, but they're four different pumpkin colors and four different sheep colors. And I got a little little bit of color changes going on there. I loved doing that pattern. It was good and fast and fun. Speaking of good and fast and fun, I have no papers in my hand tonight. This is an all talking and looking episode. So what I want to do is look at an auction that ended about a week ago on, on Pook, uh, Pook and Pook, an auction site. Now, Let's preface this conversation by saying, if you are interested in buying rugs or, is my fan too loud, by the way? You, you must tell me the truth if it's too loud. It got warm up here on the second floor, but if you can hear that fan at all, I want to turn it off, okay? So tell me the truth. I'll be so upset if I listen back later and I can hear the fan. Uh, thanks, Linda Ann. So if you want to get involved with bidding on rugs, like the ones that we're going to look at and talk about tonight on Cocktail Time, just be aware. Wendy, I do too. I do too. I love, this one is like a crazy purple, but not as bright, out, I think, as he looks. This is a real lime green, just to give you a sort of ground. Okay. Okay. But if it does get noisy, I can turn it down or off because it is cooling. It is cooling off a little bit. It's just a bit uh, oppressive, you know? I have been on online auctions. Of course, I'm not talking about eBay and I'm not talking about places that you buy outright like Etsy and some of these. I'm talking about this whole slew of online auctions that are now out there where you can find beautiful hook drugs that will be shipped to you no matter where you live. So it solves the problem of, I live in an area where um, I don't see a lot of hook drugs. It solves that problem just be aware that when you're bidding on these rugs and we'll talk about this as we go along there is always going to it's always going to be a lot more than you think because they will not give you a flat rate and they will not give you the actual cost for shipping so be careful about that there might be a flat rate you might want to talk to them before you put a bid in and there's also going to be the buyer's premium which means wherever they got the rug from that they're selling they're paying that person a commission um or, or rather they're taking part of the money, right? So they're getting some of that profit that the rug will make when it sells, but they're also charging, they're not just getting the money from the person who supplied the thing to sell, they're also getting money from you through the buyer's premium. So um, whether you are the buyer or the seller, you will be paying a set percentage. And sometimes that is like a third. 
So be careful about that too, because between shipping and buyer's premium, sometimes you think that you have bought a rug that you're spending $100 for and it's closer to 200. So be careful about that because it does put a terrible sour taste in your mouth when you spend too much on something that you feel isn't worth it and you really regret it. So just be careful because while these online auctions, and I'm not just talking about Pook and Pook, I'm talking about everybody. Sotheby's does the premiums. Everybody does the same stuff, right? Uh, it's all good stuff. It just depends on how much you want the rug. Just make sure you know how much you're signing up for when you bid. I'm always a little bit leery about online bidding, but it is so worth looking at these big auction umbrellas. Because for example, Pook and Pook and about a thousand other small, Pook and Pook isn't small, but auction houses are under some larger umbrellas like the website call. I'm gonna turn that down. I'm just, I know you're all being polite, but I feel like it's noisy. Let me just turn it down a little bit. Okay, then we got maybe maybe best, best of both worlds. Um, the big umbrellas that these auction houses are under are typically auction ninja and the sort of higher end live auctioneers. So under their monster umbrellas, there are hundreds of other small auctions that run and many of these have hooked rugs. So in many cases, you can go right to, for example, live auctioneers, type in hooked rug, antique hooked rug, vintage hooked rug, just be aware that the description of what you're buying is only as good and as accurate as the person who wrote it, okay? So more on that. Cats Gallery, great to see you. I started a, a messed up stream by accident when I logged on. I might have taken you down a bad place with me, but you're here now. That's the main thing. And he says, I need a sheep embroidery punch kit using the ultra punch. I need a sheep embroidery punch kit. Oh, using the ultra punch, so a much smaller scaled sheep. You want to do like a little guy. That should definitely be out there. Um, there are so many like mini punch, Russian punch kits and stuff on Etsy. Of course, Not Forgotten Farm is the one that jumps right into mind. There's tons of them and they are so cute. What a great project, right? Linda Ann says, I bet you can totally punch that pattern. You can definitely punch this pattern, but not with the ultra punch, with the regular uh, punch or a worsted punch. Good thing you said that. Um, I have an order of my worsted punches. You know I sell the worsted size, not the regular size. The worsted that takes two ply up to bulky. I have an order of those that are coming from, I think they come from Brazil. I love Maria who I get them from. I think they're super high quality, uh, beautiful pink handles this time. I really love them. They're super inexpensive. In my mind, they work as good as anything. So those are gonna be back in stock in the next 24 hours, just so you know. I'm waiting on those a little bit. Ryan says, the sheep would be a great beginner pattern for punchers. It absolutely would. Um, and I could do it. I should put on the listing that I can do that also with wool. It doesn't have to be the wool strips because this is a number eight cut wool strip, but I could also easily do it in yarn for punching. That would work. That would work really easily too. Um, good idea. Joy, good to see you. Cheers, my dears. Power back to watch. Thank God you're not sitting in the car today. Oh, that is so good. Your Wi-Fi is spotty. Thank God for little gifts, right? That's really, really good to hear. I'm so glad. Joy is in Florida, and when, when she logged on yesterday or the day before, it was in the car because you had no power, and now you do have power. Thank God for that, right? Isn't it funny when life brings you on such a ride that you are so happy to get back to normal, just normal, not like better than normal, just normal? Um, it's Life is just like that, isn't it? It's like that thing where you, at least for me, I see pictures of myself and I go, oh my God, I wish I was the size I was when I thought I was fat right like years ago holy mackerel Kaz says they use some of your free patterns to reduce this si you know that's a great idea Kaz you can of course use patterns to reduce the size you could do that with this too if you want it if you liked the sheep you could get it as a pdf pattern rather than the physical pattern and just make it teeny tiny and put it on the uh, weaver's cloth right which is quite easy to get as opposed to uh, one of our traditional rug hooking backings at much bigger gauge right that's a great idea. Thank you, Kaz. That's really smart. Cheers, charge my power back. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're there. So let's look at some of these rugs that came to auction. They are all beautiful. These are for the most part antique rugs. I'm going to make comments as we go along because I feel that some of them are not antique rugs. And you know, I am always not just open, but in, I want to encourage you to chime in with your opinions. I am not the end all do all, right? I've seen a lot of rugs, but so have you. And it is absolutely your place to chime in and say, well, you know what? I think I've seen this pattern. I don't think it's a 20th century rug. That kind of thing is very welcome 
always with me. I hope you know that. So let's come over to Cocktail Night and let's see what we can see. There are some exceptional, can I purchase the pattern from you and does it have to come with yarn? No, Whitney, not at all. It can come as a PDF. It can come as on fiber tape, right? Like uh, this stuff, I'm sure you know, but like uh, this stuff, the fiber tape that you just stick on your piece and trace with a Sharpie um, or backing or kit. So I always do all of those things. And if you're not seeing that because the link to pumpkin pasture is in the description of this video. If you're not seeing all those choices, it means that the listing is screwed up because it just went up like 15 minutes before the show. So just send me a note. That's something that can be corrected in literally 30 seconds. So, and I appreciate the business so much. So, oh yeah, that's a huge yes. Susie, great to see you. Happy Friday night. Good to see you. All right, let's look at some amazing beauty. And Okay, I've got that all set. So first one we're looking at here. Now, this whole first set of images I'm going to show you come from a Pook and Pook auction that ended last week. Was I asleep at the wheel, so to speak? Yes, because I had this bookmarked. I had a bunch of these images uh, favorited. And somehow, despite all that, uh, I missed the end of the auction. And I'm super frustrated with myself. I also wanted to do this with you before the auction ended. Um, obviously, I missed that. I, compl I You know how sick I have been for the better part of three weeks? I have been dropping the ball left and right, and um, I forgot. But here we are looking at them now, and we do know that auctions do come back to auction, to, to auction again and again. Now, <laughs> Linda Ann, I love this too. Such a classic, simple pattern. Reminder to everybody that I do stock a lot of antique patterns. A lot of rug hooking companies stock a lot of antique patterns. You don't need to buy them from me unless you want them as a kit or you want them on backing already. You want to save yourself that grief and aggravation. In terms of the design, you don't need to buy it from me or anyone else. If it is an antique, right, if this, it, this is kind of a moving target thing because this doesn't work exactly the same way as copyright. But if this is 100 years old or if we can assume that the person who made it has been gone for 50 years, at least in the United States, then this would qualify as something that does not have a copyright on it. Of course, that doesn't stay the same if it's like a Garrett Blue Nose pattern or if it's a pattern uh, whose copyright or the licensing of it has been maintained by family members or um, that kind of thing. But 99, oh, Ryan bookmarked some discontinued yarn, forgot to, but right? I mean, it's so irritating, isn't it? So, Ryan, did you get your pumpkin colored yarn to finish the piece that you, to get going on the piece? I know you just started it. Um, I wonder if you got that done. You don't need anyone's permission to do a copy of a rug this age. This is a 19th century rug. They're saying it's a 19th century rug. The onus is, is really on them at this point because that, that's what they're writing down. They are a formidable um, auction house. This is a real emphasis on folk art at Pook and Pook. They are extraordinary um, auctioneers. They have, for me, the most exquisite auctions of anybody. Now, a design like this has got such simple beauty going on. This is a half and half, meaning if you were to fold it over, you've got night. Oh, good. I'm glad you got that. If you fold it over, you've got the same image on both sides. We've got a little funny kind of Charlie Brown tree in the center. It looks like a little matchstick in the center or maybe a flower. Identical cats on both sides. They could be cookie cutters. They could just be drawings. We've got a simple border with a um, attempt at, not a Greek key, but like a corrugated castle wall kind of a uh, double line happening in black. Now that really is different, isn't it? If I had to choose one thing about this pattern that really stands out to me, it's the use of the light on the inner corners, the sort of postage stamp corners, right? Uh, those have been bracketed off. Yeah, exactly, Karen. It's very different. It makes you wonder about running out of material and what the thought process was for that particular motif, just, just coloring those four bits. Um, but what really stands out to me is that double black border. That is really intricate and really interesting that someone would take the time. Also, the very somber little faces, right? Kind of like uh, Mr. Bill faces on the cats very, very long before Mr. Bill. Uh, but also the color changes, the severe blocking, right, of color, a color changing brown on the cat on the right, like they just ran out and they just blocked a whole section of chest off in a different color. They did a little bit of that on the left on the same, in the same place, but then again on the back. 
interesting, charming, romantic to see how these colors play out with rugs of this age. Ryan says the faces of the cats looked like they were caught red-handed. Absolutely. It's like, um, oh, you silly ki kittens, you lost your mittens. And they're like, uh -oh. it, it is a funny, funny little expression that they both have. Really cute rug. So the estimate on this rug was between three and $500. And I'm going, to I'm going to play this game with you in a different order for the next slide. Uh, I'm going to do, how much do you think it sold for? In this case, it's too late to play the game. We'll start it on the next one. But three to 500 was the estimate, and it realized $750. So it went well over the top. And that is, uh, this is a close-up of the same rug. That is quite surprising because we know that in re recent auctions, we've looked at auctions that have closed in the last two or three months on other episodes of Coffee Time, Cocktail Time. And we have seen that in most or many cases, the rugs are not hitting the realization or the projected price, the value price. Of course, that is a bit whimsical in and of itself. That's very uh, unstable because it depends on who is putting the estimate on it. Even in a great auction house, and I, again, I'm not just talking about pook and pook. Uh, that's just what we're looking at at this moment. But even in a great auction house, sometimes you get someone who's in there and, and maybe quilts is their thing, but hook drugs are, are not. And you're seeing real discrepancies and real ball dropping with price projection and estimates. And it does change the way that people view the article because they're looking at it um, in terms of a price point to try to figure out what they think they're going to have to pay to have it. And if that price point is quite low, at least for me, I, it would be like begging the question, like, what's wrong with it? What, what am I not, what are they seeing in person that I'm not seeing in a picture on the computer? These kinds of things. What am I missing? What did they know that I don't know? Um, it's so tough with pricing, isn't it? But in this case, I'll tell you right now that in general, most of the items in this auction will go for much more than you would expect. And that is a good that is good news for us, isn't it? Now, let's start the game early here so you can start chiming in. It's like uh, Jeopardy or something, right? Uh, with your answer. So you tell me, as soon as I put this slide up, this is, a, this is an antique... Uh, American hook drug of a dog, late 19th century. Um, what do you think this rug sold for? Now, I'll look at your comments in a minute. Interesting rug, right? Interesting, full blast, hit or miss rug. We've got a couple different elements going on. At first glance, it looks like playing card suits, which is a big motif in the 19th and 20th centuries, but it's really not. We have got leaves um, on the top two corners. We've got hearts on the bottom two corners. Now, this in and of itself is already quite distinctive because would you not expect to find the, the two motifs in opposite corners, not two on top, two on bottom? I would expect to see them skewered, right? Leaf heart, leaf heart. That's what I would do. Design-wise, that's what I would do. But remember, oh, size on this. You know, Karen, I don't know. I don't know. I cropped these for like closer up viewing and I cropped that out. Um, I'm gonna assume that all of these rugs are floor rugs and I'm gonna make a further, probably really ignorant um, blanket statement that most of these rugs are not super large. These are mostly like thrift style rugs. So these would not have been like made custom type rugs. These are uh, one of a kind and they look like handmade by one person for the original purpose, just down on the floor, keeping the draft out, feet warm in the morning. So I'm expecting most of these rugs to be in the 20 something by 30 something and not bigger. That would be my, just an educated guess. I'm sure some of them will exceed that, but most of them I think will not. Um, just straight up hit or miss here with a little bit of, I'm not going to say design trouble because the thing about design is we have over the course of decades, um, dog went, okay. So Ryan's saying the dog went for 600 to 800. Excellent guess to be continued. I'll tell you that the estimate was between 400 and 700. Now, that what does that tell me, that the estimate is between 400 and 700? Not to be awful, but that tells me the person who's, that it's a guesstimate, right? The person who's putting that number on it, that is a massive window. We're usually looking for a window in auctions like this of about between, you know, a window of about 100 to 150, not a window of like 300. That's hardly a window. That's like a, a cavernous, you know, gaping gap at that point. But that is the estimate. 
Cats Gallery says 875. I will say Cats Gallery, if this was the price is right, so far you are the closest and you have not gone over the number, so you will win the entire showcase. Remember how that worked? Um, I love this too, Linda Ann. Such a crazy hit or miss background. So much going on. It's a very distracting rug, I think, because the red eye on the dog is a bit devilish. The massive color change in the center is most likely due to aging and sun exposure because there was more black, as you can see on the corner, but they didn't need it at the time, which says to me this is, a, this is black from a different source and they thought it would be okay, but over the course of 100, 150 years, cat's gallery, um, you know, it, it, it definitely changed color, right? There's no reason to think they did that on purpose because they had more black. Interesting hit or miss rug. This rug sold for $900. So that was way, that's a lot of money. It's way over the estimate. I think it is well, well worth it. This is such a cool example of a hit or miss in the, in the sort of incongruities about it are the things that make it both charming and valuable. So weird red eye. I'm guessing that those brown ears were also black at one point, don't you think? The color changes over time. This is the equivalent of patina. These are Bob Barker's voice. <laughs> are you hearing it, Ryan, in your head? <laughs> um, all of these little touches make it so enticing, interesting, valuable, right? We are not necessarily looking for condition as rug collectors. Um, we are looking for character. We are looking for signs of age, but not devastating signs of loss because then it really does take away from the viewing of it, right? We are in this weird little uh, wrinkle in time where we are looking for something real specific. Now, here is the next draw. Go ahead and put your guesses in. American hook drug with dog, late 19th century. And what a beautiful rug this is. Um, reminds me of the of the current logo for the black dog of Martha's Vineyard, right? That black dog motif, except this one is laying down. I noticed that in many auctions, they use the word recumbent. Like, it, it, it's so specific, the language that they use. It's so formal. You know, it's almost like the language of, like, uh, the medical world and the legal world. There, there's such funny terms that get used over and over. This is a recumbent dog. It's a dog who's lying down or taking a rest, a little bit of a smile on his face, a bit of a... Um, goat or lamb like uh, silhouette to his face and shape of the ear distinctly reads as a dog but look at that great kind of color changing and movement inside his body look at this great silhouette it's funny and interesting to me i love the border i absolutely love the border ryan your guess is 500 very good um i love the silhouette shape i love the two colors it's extremely graphic can't you see this going into a super hip store, restaurant, apartment, like in New York City, uh, in anywhere? I mean, this this doesn't have to be something that you see in some hallowed place, like uh, a remote corner of the Folk Art Museum. This is easily dinner table, uh, shishi club. Um, it's, Karen's guessing, 800. Um, it's very, very graphic. It's very, very effective. Isn't it kind of funny how there's a lot of business happening. It seems like the maker realized that the design was very simplistic and they were trying to, I don't want to say overcome, but they were trying to create more interest by doing funky things in the borders. And one of the things they did that was quite funky was softening up the corners of the inner square and making it into kind of that uh, exaggerated rectangle slash oval, right? Rounding those corners off interesting because they already had the square corners at the edge of the postage stamps so interesting how they've got some extra shapes in here i don't know if they had no more colors or if they just really wanted this graphic impact a genius says 625 well you a genius you are the closest but you did go over it is six hundred dollars this one went for six hundred dollars i still think that's an extraordinary amount of money it's a very simple piece it's it is absolutely worth it and if you've made your first rug you know that these are time consuming endeavors um you can see these beautiful close-ups how how neatly these rugs are hanging on you can also look at the texture of a rug like this think of this versus a middle 20th century rug where teaching technique was the thing right and it's not it's not at this point we're talking about burlap we're, we're talking about potato sacks and feed sacks it's just putting the loops where they go spacing is not a thought directional hooking is not a thought it is just filling in the lines that is the only thought and that results in a style of hooking that we sometimes 
now affectionately call higgledy-piggledy, my very favorite style of hooking. All of these rugs bear that in common. Here's the next one. So go ahead and put your number in. American uh, de de Demiloon, Demiloon? Oh, Demiloon, like half, half moon. Okay. Demiloon hooked rug circa 1900. Um, okay. That's real specific. I'd, I'd go for that. I'm going to go along with that. That's, uh, I mean, that looks right to me. Tell me if it looks right to you. Uh, beautiful rug. You know, we are just starting to see like the half moon rug in people's homes at this point. Um, up till now, we're talking about rectangles because we're talking about feed sacks and we're not wasting any of the feed sack. We are hooking right to the edges of the feed sack, but we do see around 1900, we are moving out of the Victorian era into the uh, Edwardian era. Styles are changing. We're about to encounter Art Deco. A genius says 1900. Uh, a few different things going on with this one, and it is a lovely, desirable rug, I think, because of the subject. It is almost a rug within a rug, right, because we have a beautiful depiction of a rug, a mother and baby cat on it. So we've got the sort of family subject and a cat subject at, at that, which is always going to be appealing. We've got the happy sentiment of welcome, which is something that could go in any home. We've got an extraordinary color palette happening here. Just looking at that bar border around the edge, all of those color changes, very systematic, very regular and uniform. Good amount of each color. There's no running out. There is a real effort in both cats' bodies to do some striping and striation to make them look as realistic as possible. These really look like postures of cats from Victorian postcards or book illustrations, right? Really interesting. Ryan says, apart from the antique aspect, I always think about the hours of making when something is priced high. Man hours and materials and money, absolutely. I do too. And it's, you know, it's such a hard thing. Um, it, this is something I think all rug hookers struggle with because we know how much time goes into it. Um, and it's ju it doesn't work like other things. It's not apples and apples. So, you know, when you think about how much your neighbor makes working at an office job and they get paid this much an hour, it just doesn't work like that in craft businesses. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. There are pluses that go with the nature of this business too. Like you can do it when you feel like it. If you wake up at 3.15 in the morning and that Hallmark Channel is waiting for you, you start your marathon and you work then. Um, you know, the, the good things about it are the flexibility, the way that it feeds your soul, um, the satisfaction of getting pieces done, knowing that you're doing something eternal and timeless that's a solid piece of heirloom folk art. All of these things um, are worth something to you personally. So it's just hard to price stuff out. This is something we should talk about maybe more often because I know a lot of you like to make things and sell them as you should. Um, f this, this question comes to me a lot where people, I forgot to tell you something important. Hang on. I can't believe I forgot to tell you this. So last weekend, um, I stopped at this place in Niantic, Connecticut, right on the ocean, beautiful boardwalk there, but it was cold. It was cold last weekend. The book barn is there, right? With all the, the Disney World of used bookstores. I go there all the time. If you come visit me, I'm taking you there. It's so much fun. I found some amazing inspiration books, but I went next door and there was a store there that I had not been to for like years and years. And last time I went, it was a cute little boutique type store that was on the pricey side. And I feel like maybe I bought a pair of earrings or something like that. It was cute, um, but I hadn't gone for years. And I thought, oh, you know what? I, I've been at the book barn quite a bit recently and the kids were taking some time and I thought, I'm just gonna pop next door to that other store and see what's, see what's going on over there. Well, it had changed hands six years ago. That's how long it's been. And it's now called, I think, the Red Salt Box. I'm not sure, but something like the Red Salt Box. And it is a primitives store. Get ready. So it's now three storefronts, like the original one that I shopped at for the store that's now gone, and then the two storefronts next to it, the same woman bought, I forgot her name, she was lovely. Um, I met her, her husband, her son, they were all there like moving stuff around. Amazing store some new stuff, some antique stuff, a real mix up. I was just beside myself. It was one of those moments, you know, where I had just finished a pumpkin spice coffee. It was cold outside. I could like see the ocean in the distance from the window. I had a bunch of books, used books in the back of my car. And I find this store that is like walking into a 17th century American salt box house. I mean, everything in there looked so right. Old, like I said, old stuff, new stuff. 
to make a long story short, too late, I said to her, you know, this. St I, I bought some stuff to put on one of the sets I'm working on so you can have a change of scenery behind me, uh, my mantle, right? I bought this string of gourds and some things to put above the mantle that I thought would be festive uh, for our shows in um, the next three months. So I said to her, you know, everything in here strikes me as being so extraordinarily pretty and attractive because I, I'm a rug hooker and, of course, I love, like, historic stuff and historic crafts. And she said to me, and this involves you too, she said, do you sell your rugs? Because I'd like to buy some because I don't have any hooked rugs in the store and people are asking for them. And I said, for me, no, because I'm just on a track right now where I don't have any sanity or time. And um, I, can't, I just can't, I can't get my money back um, making rugs and selling them. At this point, that's not for me. But I said, I know, I know a lot of people who make rugs and I'm gonna put it out there to all of you if you have hooked rugs that you would like to sell at this place, I'm pretty sure it's called the Red Salt Box, let me know. I will put you together um, or I'll just give you her information. And she is really anxious, whether they're new rugs, old rugs, big rugs, small rugs, she is really anxious to get some hooked rugs in there. So think about it. See if that's something, a little bit of extra money for the holidays. This is a great time to sell. This is a very wealthy part of Connecticut. It's something to think about, right? It's something to think about. If you are selling any of the rugs that you made, please check with me first because I might want to buy them first. Please give me first whack because I love all of you and all of your work. Um, and I don't want a special discount. I just want to know what you're selling. But she wants a lot of rugs, so just putting it out there. Now, back to the cat. Sorry about that long detour, but that might mean something. Primitives store. Yeah, exactly, Ryan. It's like she sells all primitive style stuff. It's just over the top. Welcome cat was estimated for between four and six hundred dollars. Um, Ryan, you are you are right there in that range. It sold for seven hundred and fifty. So it also sold four above. But take a look at this close up. You can see um, how much detail is in this rug. This is quite realistic for an antique rug. Realism is not something that they were doing then. It this is like truly um, an artist at work, isn't it? It's an extraordinary rug. So moving on to eagles, right? American hook drug with eagles. Go ahead and put your price in. Late 19th century. Now, this is a lovely rug. Of course, patriotic themes are always um, popular. This one is another one like the cats that we saw, the Mr. Bill cats at the beginning. Another one that if you, it's not exactly regular, is that it looks like it was hand drawn, probably a stencil, a piece of newspaper, somebody drew it once or so many stories in, in like histories of rug hooking, so many stories of, of there being like the, the little woman, not to be sexist, but the little woman sitting at the table and thinking, oh my, I can't draw anything to save my life. And then somebody walks in, like a family member or whatever, who, who's a great artist, and they just take out a pencil and there's your eagle. And then on a piece of newspaper, right? This You, you hear this account again and again and again. And then the little woman cuts it out and puts it onto the backing and then traces around it with whatever and that is her stencil you hear that story a lot the, that the person who made it didn't feel that they had any kind of intrinsic um, drawing ability so they found someone who did who did a nice picture for them and then they ran with it this feels like that to me because it's not quite even it's they're both a little bit slanted this karen this might be a larger rug and i i'm only guessing because um there are all, the main the main motif is the two eagles and they're not straight, which makes me think that somebody standing up looking at it had a piece of fabric that was large enough that it wasn't instantly obvious um, that they weren't that they weren't squared. You know what I mean? Because if it was a smaller piece, you'd immediately say, "Oh wait a minute, I got to tip that a little bit over. That's not quite even, is it?" Um, but they didn't see that, which makes me think this has potential to be a much larger rug. Um, beautiful scroll at the bottom. Uh, some. A, Four, four corners of flowers, right? And then a beautiful zigzag border. These are much faded colors. But weirdly, that great contrast in the center between the white and the black is still very, very strong. Good patriotic colors, but I suspect that was a strong blue in the border. Um, not clear at all on how old this rug is, but for myself, I'd put it probably um, 1870s, 1880s. Um, we do get a lot of patriotic rugs after the Civil War, as you can imagine. 
I don't think it's 20th century rug at all. I could be wrong, but I mean, in, unless it suffered a lot of indignities. Okay, so Whitney says 1,200. Karen says 800. Let me show you a close-up of it. I will tell you that the projection for this rug was between four and $600. And this, even this close-up looks quite good to me. We're not talking about a lot of wool here. I'm seeing a lot of silk here, which is par for the course, because if you can imagine um, any kind of like discarded clothing, castaway clothing, uh, a lot of women are gonna be wearing silks or taff like taffetas, those kinds of what we now consider luxury materials. They weren't necessarily out of the park expensive back then, particularly in darker colors. So interesting, but you know, you do get a lot of fabric with a dress from this period because of the um, amount of shearing or cinching around the waist, right? Some, it, it's massive. It's like bigger than a set of curtains, a woman's skirt at this point in time. So a lot of material, beautiful, beautiful colors. For some reason, this eagle piece fell super flat. It did not reach even 400. This piece sold for $225. I mean, that's really, really low. Why? I don't know. It's not, it's patriotic. It's not necessarily uh, a standout graphically. The scroll is a little bit um, confusing. The color change on the eagle on the right is a little bit confusing. Some of the colors are great, some of the colors are not, and there is a real visible um, discoloration problem at the top middle, and that is kind of a one of the places that your eye will go. It's not it's not a two hundred and twenty five dollar piece, um, so I think it I think it sold very low, but. At the same time, I could see that this piece has a few problems that I personally would think would have been saved by the fact that it is a patriotic piece. And most people like patriotic pieces, but I'm not getting political. I'm just going to say that only goes as far as how patriotic people are feel. I want to be sure that you are seeing these. It only goes as far as how patriotic people are feeling at this moment, right? So if people are not feeling particularly patriotic at this moment, uh, they are not going to be feeling like splurging on a patriotic rug. That's part of it. These are all like the, the movable um, aspects to buying and selling that cannot be measured and are very hard to forecast, right? So let's move on to the next one. That was a bit of an upset, wasn't it? That was a bit surprising. Hold on. just to, Oh, I see. Okay, wait a minute. I screwed that up good. Yep. Okay, here we go. Now, different conversation here. Let me just, I'm going to wet my whistle. This was a major ball drop for Pook and Pook, and they are my favorite auction house. But this says American Hook Drug, early 20th century. Uh, the major ball drop is that this is a signed rug, and it's it's been it's signed by somebody who even I recognize the signature. It's Barbara Mary. So Barbara Mary is a seriously important uh, late 20th century maker, right? 60s, 70s. Um, very important uh, northern New England maker. So, you know, she has, her work appeared at least once in Rug Cooking Magazine. Her rugs are out there. I see them quite a bit. I want to talk more about that, but she was not named in this. Um, and I feel like it wouldn't take that much research to Google hooked rug B-E-M, because if you do, if you spend more than 20 seconds on it, you're going to know that this is a Barbara Mary rug. Um, Whitney is guessing 500. Karen is guessing 800. Um, her work is extraordinary. She is a northern New Englander. She uh, does a lot with these country themes. These are all original patterns. These are definitely on the folky primitive side. Um, for me, most of her subjects are um, very country, very outdoorsy, um, not romantic, right? Not that they have to be by any means. They're very literal. So, for example, this is one of my favorite images of hers that I've seen. She does a lot. Um, she does a lot with African American characters, and in some of the rugs, I think that it can be problematic. It's it's obviously on its own. It's not, um, but there there are some rugs that are depictions of like Deep South and scenes from, um, which can be difficult subjects. I'm being delicate as you can tell, right? So sometimes these kinds of subjects can be problematic. Um, at the end of the day, this is a great rug. It's a great composition. My favorite things about this composition are the house in the foreground, standing the way that it is, right? This m majorly color changing, 
a patterned material, right, wool right on that first house. The striping on the roof, it almost looks like corrugated uh, tin roof or something like that. Really charming. Log cabin feel. I like the little pond off to the left, right, with the little mill uh, uh, wheel on it. My favorite thing about this rug is the collection of almost identical houses, including the mill, in the background, right? And I really love the little gray ribbon that's like a little valance that co connects the rugs. That weird kind of crescent shape that's going from one to the next creates this beautiful sort of center for me in the center of the rug. You see that there's an open space where life might happen, where animals might happen, where events might happen. There is a very happy, cozy cluster of buildings that creates this tiny village center. It's super, super sweet, right? It's very familiar. The sky is wonderful too. That skeletal tree is wonderful. It has a lot of repeat motif going on. Uh, and that's very strong. It's very strong. There's a lot happening in the foreground. But for me, the real prestige of this piece is both the border, and I think there might be a braid on this one. I can't see it close up. I know one of hers has one. This might be whipped. Um, I love the collection of house, and I love the little ribbon connecting them. The houses in the background are stunning. Ryan, they are absolutely beautiful. So Cat's Gallery says 1,000. Karen says 800. Whitney says 1,200. The estimate on this one was between five and $800. This one sold for remarkably little uh, for me. It sold over the highest estimate at 850, but like most of you, I feel that it really should have gone uh, for more. Um, I feel that her work is important. It is finite. She is gone. Uh, her work lives on. It needs to be. It needs to be collected. It is a great example of contemporary folk art. Super, super beautiful. Now. Carrying on this conversation about Barbara Mary, I want to show you some other Barbara Mary rugs. Um, this one is currently for sale on Etsy. I forget how much this one um, costs. I feel, well, it's it's sold by a seller on Etsy called Cogno, uh, Cogno Cent, Centifog. So uh, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-E-N-T-I folk art. That was a tough one. Cog no senti folk art. It probably spells something, and I'm like playing boggle in my head. I'm not getting it. But if you Google Barbara Mary Rog on Etsy or even just on Google, this will come up. And you can see it's signed B-E-M. Barbara Mary does a lot with the rainbow arc as a motif in the sky, a unifying motif, a hopeful motif. Um, we talked about this in the Grandma Moses class. This is a great folk device, putting a rainbow up in the sky. Everything under it becomes part of the story. Everything is unified. It's smart. Uh, this is another beautiful piece, a very grand house for Barbara Mary in this piece. Makes me think this is a house that, that was in her neighborhood that she was aware of. She always does interesting things with colors. She's, she's given us a rainbow, but it's, it's in drab colors. Uh, it's not in rainbow colors. You know, the interesting thing about saying the word drab is all three of those colors are drab colors in the rainbow. Do you know that drab, this is just a bit of trivia, right, while we're playing games sort of tonight. Do you know that drab was originally a fabric and not a color? So drab referred to um, a, a specific fabric that was a sort of a lower end fabric, right, very good for work clothes and that kind of thing. It was made with these whatever earthy colors were available, but it was not a specific color. So originally drab could have been anything from like an ochre color, like a honey mustard color, through the army green colors, through like the black chestnut brown colors. All of those colors at one time were called drab because the material was called drab. Later on, we started to be real specific about what we would call a specific material. But in those days, the days of like the general store, the country store, uh, the peddler coming through with a bolt of material, you would say, I'll take some drab. And whether it was the honey mustard color or the black chestnut color, you didn't probably care. You just wanted the material and that's what the material was. Now drab tends to be like more of a khaki army color, but it wasn't always that way. What made me think about that is that Barbara Mary works uh, in a lot of drab colors, and this rainbow is, is very drab, uh, but very picturesque. I think it's still a very moving piece. So uh, that's one of her pieces currently on Etsy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I do have a price for it. It's 1250 and this is a close-up of the same Etsy rug. Um, and, and you can see the, the lettering is not quite as precise here. 
Um, I believe that she worked in hand cuts. So lots of um, differences to the size, the weight, the width of the materials that she's plugging in, but lots of different materials. Really, really uh, beautiful piece. So that one is currently on Etsy. Uh, this is another Barbara Mary. Uh, love it. Oh, thanks, Ryan. Um, this is another Barbara Mary that's called, oh, no, wait a minute. No, is this the same one? Hang on, let me check. Ooh, 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 don't do it, don't delete. This is the same one. I did one more close-up. Um, I think this is called Rainbow Over Cabin in Maine. This is just another close-up of the same one on Etsy. Look at the amount of colors that she has put into the house. And lo and behold, there is a character in this. I, I just want to snap back to the first one because it's, oops, wait a minute. It's very hard to tell sometimes. Um, the characters are secondary to her storytelling. Uh, and that is part of what gives it this folk quality. The person... And if that's a cat on the right, or certainly not in proportion to the house, nor is the rainbow, nor is anything. And that is part of the charm of it. But characters seem to be secondary. Um, the, her, her pieces are so structural, and, and they are so much in the vein of original early rug making, aren't they? All these color changes in the house, the, the choice of red outlining the windows, very, very unusual. Now, this is a different one, and this was so, this is Barbara Mary, and you see she's signing her name differently here, B.E. Mary. So this was put up um, as one of two rugs. This was, I want to say, 2014, 2016. It wasn't recently, but Morphe, M-O-R-P-H-Y, Morphe Auctions auctioned a lot of two uh, Barbara Mary rugs. This is one of the two, and together they both sold for two $237, $237. This is the first rug. I'm about to show you the second. I just want you to note um, that the border of this rug is is, stand, is, is is like standing up wool, right? I mean, that's like extraordinary. This is standing up wool, like quilly, but not wound. Um, you get standing up rugs, right? We call them standing up rugs. But it's very unusual to see something, that both the rainbow and the border. Oh, also the path on this one, that is standing up wool. So that is wool that is cut on its side and applied with sewing, not with hooking, flat to the backing material. So you would have to leave room for that in your hooking, right? You would have to leave a gap for the rainbow, for the lane. But this is a great idea. This is another great kind of application that you can do, not with a hook again. This has to be done with a needle. You are applying pieces of wool that are standing up to create this effect. I thought this was extraordinary. Another very grand house. So both this rug and this rug together sold for $237. That breaks my heart. Another very odd rainbow. Another, you know, we've got a huge... Um, the, t the kinds of houses that she covers seem to be either palatial brides had revisited type mansions or humble log cabins. There's not a lot in the middle with Barbara Mary. Very unusual. The really, um, you know, devil may care way that she plugs in patterned wool in place of solid wool. Like she's not really going out of her way to say, well, uh, at the bottom of this rainbow, it doesn't make sense to use a patterned wool. I'm going to stick with another solid. She just does it. This is part of what she does. It creates a lot of interest. Um, this is one of her things, right? And, and what you really want when you're an artist is a thing. This is really one of her things. So both of those rugs, Barbara Mary rugs, uh, the wonderful blog, Sandra Woodland Junction, S-A-U-N-D-R-A. I hope that you follow this blog, Sandra Woodland, one word, Junction. It's a rug hooking blog. It is fantastic. She did an entry on Barbara Mary rugs last year. I feel like it was, gosh, I feel like it was 2021. Uh, and obviously, this is another Barbara Mary rug. We see this BEM. It's not hard to track down this BEM. Another very rural scene. Um, I guess a cow or a bull or something standing in front of a b outbuilding, a barn building. Uh, beautiful multicolored um, zigzag border. Really unusual. Just really unusual. Um, all very different, right? They're, they're all very different. They're very primitive. Um, and weirdly literal. And this was also on the Sandra Woodland Junction 
um, website. So this is Barbara Mary on the left with this woman named Anne who actually got in touch with Sandra of Woodland Junction and gave her material and photographs, images for this particular blog. So this is Barbara Mary on the left holding up this horse rug, um, which again is extraordinary and you can see the BEM marked on this rug as well. This is, um, this is another, I just went down this rabbit hole a little bit. This is another Barbara Mary rug that is not signed, which is unusual. This one belongs to the Maine Historical Society, but what are we seeing in this one that we have seen many times before? Collection of village houses, zigzag border done in multi-colors, right? Exactly the right kind of houses, pathway connecting the houses, right? All of this is Barbara Mary stuff. And this particular rug has been, um, in terms of provenance, named and claimed as a Barbara Mary rug by Mildred Pelado, right, who is the uh, hooked rug historian, particularly for the Maine area, right, who does all of the writing on Maine rugs. Uh, she certainly would know, and she is the person who has given the attribution for this rug being a Barbara Mary rug. One one more thing on the Barbara Mary subject before we move on. These two rugs are currently available on Facebook Marketplace, if you're interested. Uh, they are both located in Lincolnville, Maine. And if you search uh, hooked rug Barbara Mary, you will find this rug on Facebook Marketplace, which does not work the same way as an auction. Again, these are in Lincolnville, Maine. And this one, same seller. This one, very similar to the one we just looked at with that cow, bull, whatever, with the log cabin in front. In fact, it might be the same log cabin. This one looks like a bear is approaching some um, skeps, some beehives. Is, is that what it looks like to you? At least that's what it looks like to me. I'm not sure. But two beautiful rugs, two more Barbara Marys that are available. Just reminding you that if you are interested in collecting, you know, we started off talking about we're continuing uh, to look. The next slide is going to be pook and pook. But just a reminder that when you go down the rabbit hole and you start looking for something, just do your own Google searches. It's not, it's not, you know, sorcery. You just put in what you're looking for. You find someone who you like. You start to search for that person. If, if the website like eBay or whatever is asking you, Facebook Marketplace, um, asking you, you know, do you want to put a permanent search in for this? Yes, I do. I would like to know when a Barbara Mary rug pops up or when a Hutchinson rug pops up or whatever. Um, go ahead and do that with your stuff. Then you'll be the Johnny on the spot when that thing turns up. Now, these are a couple of other, I, I put different genres of rugs in here because I thought you might enjoy. I know, I know what you like. Uh, these are penny rugs. So these are a pair of felt penny rugs, 19th century. Go ahead and put your guesses in here. These are extraordinary. Now, they look extraordinary, right? But wait, just be, wait and behold this close up. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Now, wait a minute. Come back out here with me. Okay, so they look good. They look dangy good, but then you come in here and you go, oh, my mind is blown. Can you see those tiny stitches that are there? Can you see those little things? I mean, that is just squirrel nutkins. There's like tiny stitches. All of this, this is not a straightforward penny rug. Some of them are pennies, circles within circles, graduated circles, but others are pennies, meaning... And, and you probably know this, I'm sure, and I've said this before, but the reason that these rugs are called penny rugs is because uh, during the Civil War, when this rug came about for the first time, these circle-driven felt rugs, the size of a penny was like almost an inch. So they were much larger pennies in those days, and people would use those as a template to trace their circles and cut them. So it would make a lot of sense that they were called penny rugs because they were using an actual penny for a template. Our pennies, of course, are much smaller. Anita, good to see you nowadays. But this is an extraordinary rug. What do you think something like this, a pair of penny rugs, would be worth? Because this is, obviously, if you are a collector of penny rugs, um, you're going to have a hard time passing up this pair. So the estimate on this rug was, let's see, uh, 400 to 600. It's, it's a pair. So the estimate was for two rugs between 400 and 600. What do you think about that? It's not enough. I'll tell you, it went for twice the high end. It went for 1,200. And you know what? It, it's worth it. Look at these things. I mean, this is folk art. This, I don't know that I would need two of them. That's the problem with this. I'd love, I'd love to um, frame one of them. Two of them, I don't know. I mean, I, they would make nice 
sides, um, you know, if you had your mantle and you put them on the two ends and then you put some sculptures or some other stuff in the middle, they would make a nice sort of bookend effect. Um, these are just extraordinary, extraordinary rugs. Uh, they are also in a regular shape. I don't know enough about pen collecting penny rugs to know whether that is um, sort of attribute or a handicap because when you've got in a regular shape like this, if you are going to frame it, you need to think about how that's going to work. Um, but sometimes the framing and the shape can be a consideration for a collector because you want something that fits in with the other things around it um, and you're not looking for a regular shapes. I, I think these are so extraordinary that anybody who likes felt anything would go for them. This is another one that's a little outside of our wheelhouse, but inflation, exactly. <laughs> Ryan, inflation, good one. Um, this, is a, this is a braided table mat, they're saying. Now, they're calling it a table mat, but you can tell by the scale, it's, it's still quite large, unless they're, you know, these are like shoelace-sized um, braids. This, this, to me, does not look like a table mat. I'm sorry that I don't have the sizes, but to me, this looks like a full-size rug. I know what braided rugs look like, and I know what it is to braid a rug, and this, is, this looks quite large to me, so I'm not sure about that. Um, the description of a lot of these things is very heavy on the, the word mat and not rug. Um, also very heavy on the word throw, but we'll come to that later. So Vibrant Pennsylvania Braided Table Mat 19th Century. This really glows. This is one of these rugs where you start off kind of traditional, and then you start, when you get to that very light haze around that circular center, what they're doing is they're bringing a couple strands of braiding around, and then they're going off on a bit of a cul-de-sac, right? Like, like you're turning, you took the wrong turn, and you're turning around on the side road and coming back down. They're doing that right the way around, spacing it carefully, and then they're just going to braid the, f the further sort of concentric circles, rounds, um, around those offshoots. So it is tricky, but it's not impossible. It's, again, not sorcery. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, very complex rug. I didn't know you could put a permanent put. Yeah, Cat's Gallery, you can with a lot of sites. Definitely eBay. Um, you can do saved searches. Facebook Marketplace, I have lots of saved searches. And probably more. Um, I have saved searches on live auctioneers and saved searches on Auction Ninja. And they email me when things come up. You just have to be careful that your saved search uh, feedback and results are not going into your spam folder because 99% of the time they do and then you miss it, and then it's all for naught. But uh, yeah, you can do a lot of, lot of saved searches. They want you to save searches because they want you to come back and shop. So this estimate for this rug was three to $400. I think that is like a cry in shame. Um, this rug is worth a lot more. A braided rug of this kind of shape distinction, it's not unheard of to see a rug with like this kind of spoke effect coming off of it, but it's not typical. It is very hard to find these. This one still, in my opinion, sold very low. Estimate was three to four hundred. It sold for seven hundred. I still consider that very low for this particular rug. I really do. Um, this is a close-up of the rug. Beautiful colors, some textured wool, some very different wool. It is a bit worn. Um, it's just a beautiful piece for the for the wall, right? I mean, I'm sure it would go on the floor. I'm doing a cheers, my dears here. So here we go to our next one. Now, this is one of these that has the word throw in it, and I'm not sure why. Embroidered felt table throw circa 1900. Now, I'm going to bring you in closer to this, too. This is more of an applique job, but I thought you might still be interested in it. It has a bit of like an Eastern European slash Russian feel to it, doesn't it? Uh, Karen says it reminds me of a Tinker Toy. Um, yeah, the last one did. It had that kind of spoke thing going on. Absolutely, with the stick sticking off of it. Absolutely. That, that is a cool comparison. I got to look again. That is a very cool comparison. That is totally what it looks like. All the little sticks sticking out from the edge. The thing that baffles me about this particular one is why are they calling it a table throw? I mean, when I think of a throw, I think of, at best, like a piano shawl, something like that, a piano scarf going over like the edge of a table, the back of a piano, the back of a couch. Um, I, I personally have no experience with the term table throw. They're kind of oxymorons for me. If it's going on the table, it probably will be laid or set, um, very contrived, but not thrown. So that's confusing for me. I wonder, I'm, I'm wondering, because that comes up quite a bit during this auction. 
This is a stunning piece uh, whose estimate was between four and seven hundred dollars. It is an exquisite piece and this is why. There's an extraordinary amount of embroidery here and, and some of it is color changing embroidery. So for a 1900 piece, there is a lot of sort of silk thread in here, a lot of needlework, a lot of candle wicked. Those dit dots are candle wicked, or if you prefer French, um, French knots. Uh, very simple stitches, but lots of them, lots of basket stitches, nothing really wild here, but just quantity wise, um, it's, a, it's a very busy rug with a lot of work. Estimate was between four and 700, and this one sold right under at 650. So certainly the higher end of the estimate, uh, it really is another museum piece, the piece. They're not showing us a close up of the border. For me, that's hard to see on the size I've got going. There seems to be different things of different scales here. Color-wise, it is really striking. This is a very contemporary piece for us still. It's not my taste, but I can see how much work has gone into it, uh, and I'm not surprised that it cost $6.50. If you went to an antique store, wouldn't you expect it to be a bit more than this? I would be expecting more like 16 to be honest, to, in that somebody would eventually haggle them down to maybe 1200 but 650 seems to me like a very good price for that. Again, you're not going to get the top, top, top price when you're not seeing something in person. Uh, very few people will take, unless you can truly afford it, very few people will take that kind of a chance with a big number like that. This is another felt penny rug, and really, really another, you see how Pook and Pook, they really get these real distinctive pieces. They're very, very different, very high-end folk art. Another penny rug. These are not graduated pennies. These are pictorial pennies. We've got a repeat pattern that is color-coded. I mean, this is exquisite, isn't it? Look at the tiny lamb's tongues around the edges, too. Isn't this extraordinary? There is a little discoloration. There have been issues over the years, but American felt penny rug, late 19th century, this over 100 years old. Um, this, th this is a massive effort to get this thing color-coded in this exact way. It has really stood the test of time. The, the um, estimate projection for this one, isn't it, Ryan? It's insane. It's absolutely insane. It is so decorative. It's nutty. The estimate for this was between 800 and 1200. Let me show you a close up because you're, I'm sure, dying to see these little guys. Are you kidding me? Like, honestly, are you kidding me? So, in the case of this penny rug, they, they didn't do the basket stitch uh, around the, also known as the blanket stitch, around the edge and then apply the penny. They, they did both at the same time. They did the basket stitch and sewed it to the backing at the same time. That is tricky. Um, because I'm guessing that they did all the embroidery work and then uh, did the edging and applied all in one go. Of course, there's so many ways that you can do penny rugs. It depends on how you best work, how you best see it, how much flexibility you want as you put it together. With a piece like this, you can't go for much flexibility because you're saying to yourself, I've got to have a diamond in the center that's all the white pieces, that's nine pieces. And then right around the edge of that, I want uh, five of the oranges on each side, so that's ten. And then I want five of the yellows on the outer side, so that's another 10. It has to be that way for me to get this color plan. So knowing that, you can see how they would have done all the decorative embroidery work on the individual pennies and then been absolutely ready to apply the pennies to the backing without any second thoughts because they had the color plan in place. So that that is something. This penny rug sold for 1100 so just under the high end estimate of 1200 this sold for 1100 this is an exquisite piece. This is worth every penny. This is, if kept well, this is a piece that will never depreciate in value. There's so much handwork in this. And no, no matter what happens in the future, there are always going to be people like us who value and love handwork. And there was a lot of handwork in that piece. This is a little different again. This is one of the only quilts. I think this was the only quilt in this auction. A triple Irish chain quilt, 19th century. So this is a very familiar pattern. Uh, very pixelated pattern, still popular. This was popular as an Amish pattern, too. Uh, very s simple looking quilt, but of course it's not simple. It's made up of lots of pieces. Uh, I'm going to show you a close up in, in a minute. This one, the estimate was three to five hundred. You're maybe looking at it and saying, yeah, that's pretty basic, but it's pretty. It's not as basic as you think because this is the kind of quilting that's happening on this piece. So there's a lot of what I have to assume is hand quilting, although I might be wrong. Um, 
you know, it's so hard to say because this is a 19th century um, piece. Of course, the sewing machine had been invented at the end of the 19th century, uh, but most people did not have one at home until the 1920s. So I'm guessing that this would have been hand quilted. Uh, if you're not familiar with quilts, the quilting part of the quilt is when you've got your top fabric, your batting fabric, the soft part in the middle, and then the back of it, which is usually plain, and you are actually quilting the three pieces together. The act of quilting is attaching all three together with usually decorative stitches. And in this case, it's a circular kind of rosette medallion motif. This is a oldie, right, an old quilting motif. And in quilting the three pieces together, you create a quilt. So it is both a noun and a verb, right? So this piece actually sold for 300, which is the low end of the estimate. Um, so that wasn't a great uh, realization in terms of value. It looks like the entire border is also quilted, po possibly and probably with the same rosettes. It does have a great sort of miniature sawtooth pattern happening. Those are the little um, sharp pieces, right, that look like the edges of a saw around the border. There's a lot of work that went in this too. $300 is a very good price for a quilt of this age with this much work in it. Let's look at another extraordinary penny rug. This is a vibrant felt penny rug table runner, 19th century. So this was estimated at between 250 and 350. Another extraordinary piece of work. This is another penny rug that has a real color plan happening. Now you don't always see this in penny rugs, right? You really do have to plan ahead if you're going to if you're going to create a color plan. This is a nice long one definitely destined for a tabletop or a console kind of situation. Very, very pretty, very decorative. Um, lovely center with the kind of dark eyes in the center and then going out to the red uh, inner circles, all these graduated sizes of pennies, true penny rug, right? Exactly the way that we expect to see them. Estimate on this between 250 and 350. This one actually sold extremely well at 900. So it went way, way, way past the high end of the estimate. Now, why did it do that? Well, I think number one, let's back out of it for a second, just so we can talk about value. And you know, when you're out shopping or you're shopping online or you're looking at the next auction and you're trying to figure out how much is this gonna go for? If I were to name a handful of colors that are the most traditional and desirable for penny rug, it would definitely be drabs blacks and reds and this rug has those three colors with this kind of a rug a penny rug is a very particular form collectors are not looking for far out varieties they're looking for an example of the best example of the form uh, the form is really known for these bright red centers it, again it is like with the same idea of a log cabin quilt that in the center the home fire is burning right good luck prosperity a feeling of coziness People at this time in the late 19th century would have recognized the symbolism of having red centers on your rug. So this could symbolize a collection of people or in some kind of an interior surrounded by like all of these home fires, all of this coziness, all of this protection. Uh, the red centers are a thing and that is a thing that the collectors are looking for. Besides having the colors right, these are not your typical three stack graduated pennies. These are four stacks. And each round has a really fussy and perfect blanket stitch, each round. So part of the look of the rug is the thread, right? I mean, interesting, because this is so much work. This is so much work. So these have, prob these have probably been sewn and then stacked and applied. Um, extraordinary because you can see how some of the edges are disappearing under the others that means that they are not tacked onto the backing and they don't have to be this is a form where you do not have to have every round tacked onto your backing that isn't the deal you do it however you want these are decorative appliques right they're supposed to be meaningful they're supposed to be pretty they don't have to be necessarily um, functional right so Amazing rug, 900 is a good price for it. I could have seen it going even higher, uh, but 900 is a great is a great price for sure. Here is another variety of rug, a framed felt. Again, table throw. Agenia says, is there a foundation material with uh, the penny sewn on? Yes, Agenia, let's go back. So with penny rugs, you can, you can uh, create your pennies individually by stacking them, 
different sizes, just cutting them out with scissors, right? Three different sized cups or spools or shot glasses, whatever you have that's a circle. Um, you make your piles of pennies and then you kind of sit and decide what your color plan will be. Unless like a couple of the rugs we've seen are real specific color plans. Once you have your shoe box of pennies, right? So to speak, you can sew them onto anything because you're attaching them with a needle and a thread. So anything that a needle and thread can go through, your pennies can be attached to. So you could attach pennies to, for example, burlap, colored burlap, super inexpensive, great idea, very rustic, farmhouse, primitive looking, perfect. Historically, penny rugs were sewn onto wool, whether it was felted wool, meaning what we now just call felt, that very dense matted wool, or a looser weave, right? Like more toward like a homespun kind of a, a weave to it, much looser. Doesn't matter. Most pennies were sewn onto a wool backing. But today, with so many more fabrics available to us, you can sew them onto anything. You could sew pennies onto flannel. You could sew pennies onto cut up um, sweater material. Like for example, if you have an old sweater that you've had it with or doesn't fit or it turns out to be too itchy or has a few holes in it, you could cut that backing material of the sweater as big as you could get it into a square or rectangle and you could sew your pennies onto that. You could sew your pennies onto anything. So that is, ex that is exciting. But the traditional backing is wool or wool felt, um, which doesn't at all mean that that's what you have to do. You could even do it on shirting or anything. You could sew pennies onto velvet or like luxury materials, fancy materials, uh, velveteen, satin, taffeta, dupioni, um, so many choices. So, okay, so we were on this guy. This is a funny one. Um, and again, I, I just can't, yeah, I just can't make out what's going on here with the framed felt table throw. So this is framed. I, w I was, you know, as you know, asleep at the wheel for this auction because this is the piece I would have bought. Um, absolutely love this piece. So let's look at this um, closer up. I hope I have a second photo of this. I'm not seeing it in my slideshow. That's frustrating. I hope, yes, I do have it. So this is a composition that works around a central woven. And, and it's, it looks to be either wool, cotton, silk, something like that. Someone has cut strips and woven with their hands like a basket weave. Very, very simple. They've done it with their hands, right? This is not done on a loom. This is something that someone has woven. Like, you know how, do you remember being in school and, and weaving like baskets and stuff for Easter or whatever with a uh, paper? This is that. So somebody has done a central motif that is a weave and around that border, they have done these lamb's tongues and they have blanket stitched around the lamb's tongues. And the blanket stitch are very irregular, which tell me that the person cut these out with scissors, which is a huge part of the charm really ratchets up the desirability. Karen says old wool blankets, great for backing. Absolutely. That's a great idea, Karen, because those wool blankets for us as hookers are not good for anything else because they're so thick, but absolutely perfect for pennies. That's a great idea. I love this piece. The estimate on this framed uh, piece was between 300 and 400. Let me show you a close-up of it. Now, I'm going to tell you this piece sold right in the middle at 350. So, I mean, I understand why, but that seems a little bit low to me because there's a lot going on with this piece. One of the things that's curious for me in looking at it, beautiful blanket stitch around the lamb's tongues, right? That's very desirable. Let's back up for a minute. Um, around every lamb's tongue. The color variety in the lamb's tongue is crazy. It's great. It's perfect. It's just what you want. Lots of drabs, lots of patterns, right? And a good mix of other colors. It creates a real rainbow. It's just gorgeous. I love, I personally love that central piece that's been hand woven. Now, one of the things that's going on here, when you look at it closely, is there is a running stitch on the edge of that woven center that is certainly a, mas a machine stitch. So interesting because um, late 19th century, so what, what I'm struggling with here is that I'm not, I'm sure that it is a late 19th century piece. I'm confused by the machine stitching because I'm sure that that's machine stitching. Now again, in the late 19th century, there were sewing machines, but people did not typically have them. It was extremely, I'm not gonna start again because um, 
you know, I wanted to kind of not go too late tonight because I'm just not, still not 100%. Um, although the sewing machine had been around for many decades, it was not common at all for people to have a sewing machine in their home until the 1920s, and then it still was not common at all. So once we hit the 1920s, it's that moment of time where, say that on your street, of all the ladies who are there who would love to have a sewing machine, the price is prohibitive. So you might say to the other ladies on your street, listen, can we talk the husbands into getting us a, a sewing machine that we share for the street? Well, well, like five, 10 of us go in together. And then this was extremely common right through the middle 20th century until sewing machines became more affordable. And it made, and, and it, made it possible for people to own them privately at home. Most people by far at this time shared sewing machines. And you would say, well, my day is every second Tuesday that I get to use it. And on that day, you would bring that sewing machine to your house because it was portable, right? It weighed a ton, but it was portable. Probably weighed a ton, right? We're not talking about featherweights and we're talking about just like the, 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 um, the old machines that run like uh, trains, right? Really heavy, heavy duty machines. And if your day was Tuesday, you would bring that machine over. You would clear your schedule on that day. You would mend everything that needed mending, finish things that were being sewn from scratch, uh, make repairs to clothing, make repairs to household items, start new projects. That was your day. People got crazy about their sewing machine days. It's a big part of at least American history. This could be one of those things because I just don't see someone making this style of rug in the late 19th century also having a sewing machine. That's the part that for me is problematic. But I can see um, somebody sharing a sewing machine. It's not as common in the 19th century as it was in the 20th century. It's not impossible. This rug poses lots of questions for me and sort of mysteries. And I guess one of the things that unsettles me a little bit is that I certainly don't know, and I certainly don't know by looking at photographs, but it's not impossible that that centerpiece was added later. There might have been some damage, loss, holes, or whatever, and someone just added a different kind of hand-done piece in the center. And if that's the case, that would change the value because we're talking about a hybrid item at this point. Um, I would love to, s it's framed, so we can't see under it, but I would love to see under um, that centerpiece and see if there's something under there that's ragged, been replaced, bit of a palimpsest, we used that word yesterday on, on coffee time, whether there's something under there that's hiding and whether um, to salvage this piece, this central uh, woven part was added much later, right? Because then that changes the year and it changes the value. Dave says, uh, the first TV I remember had a handle on it, therefore portable, weighed about 100 pounds. <laughs> totally. Isn't that funny? Just like the computers, the old computers, they were so huge and heavy. Oh, there is another quilt in this. So this is a Lone Star quilt, early 20th century, super colorful example. Um, I would say definitely early 20th century, really colorful rug. And I see a print in there. So that makes me immediately think feed sack. The estimate on this piece was uh, between $200 and $300. Let me show you a close up of this Lone Star. Yeah, that's got to be a feed sack. This does look hand sewn to me, though. These little dit dot stitches, it does look definitely hand sewn. Uh, so that is nice about it. This one sold for $450. So it sold way over the top of the estimate. Um, which is funny because the other quilt that the um what was it the texas star no not this is the lone star now what was the other one we saw come on i think i need another sip it's facilitating thought i'm just going backwards let me see what the heck is wrong with me it's already gone gosh doesn't matter i guess right you know the white the white quilt that we saw triple chain the irish triple chain that's it that one sold um, a little on the low side. This one sold much higher. So just interesting. Different people, different colors. Um, and certainly the, the pattern can make a big difference. It, people love a lone star. Um, very desirable pattern. It is a nice one, too. I like the split, uh, the look of the corners being split because the red disappears into the red. That is a cool kind of look. Um, this doesn't have huge appeal for me personally, but again, who's, ask, who's asking me? But 450 I think, um, is a good price for this. It is a beautiful hand-sewn quilt. Thank you, Ryan. Good memory. <clears throat> I'm going to wet my whistle really quick while we look at the next one. It's helping me with my sore throat problem. I have, I've only ever been drinking with you, and I don't even think I had a drink last week. I, maybe I did. It was the child's party, remember? Mm. This is a nice one. 
you know, tonight is one of those nights that some of these antique patterns I peeled off for ribbon candy hooking and they are available on ribbon candy hooking. If you, there's, I think, six rugs that I, that I peeled that I did an interpretation of that if you want them, I've got them in ribbon candy hooking and the links to them are in the description to this video tonight. So they're there. Of course, you don't need mine. You can draw it yourself if you want to. But if you want me to draw it for you or put it on backing, I think they're all at about $30, $35. I'm trying to keep them low because I didn't design them. I just don't want to lose money on the backing and on my time. But I'm trying to keep them very, very low because that's not my design. I didn't agonize and spend tons of time on the design. Uh, someone else designed it. I just want to make it available to you because some of these are beautiful pieces. This is one of them. The estimate for this hook drug is between three and 500. This one, when I drew it out, I called it Bridge Party because it had that like playing card feel to it and reminded me of the dimensions of one of those fold out card tables that people used to pop open in their living room and play bridge on like in the 1940s with their bridge tallies on the corner and oh, what a moment in time, right? So the estimate on this was between three and 500 and it sold for 700 and it really is an exquisite piece. The amount of color change, this has potential to be a much larger rug uh, than, a, than a like little mat for the floor. This to me of all the rugs tonight looks like it has potential to be an almost room sized rug. Um, not because it's fine or detailed, just because I'm just looking at each strip of wool and thinking there's a lot of them in a row. This, this has potential to be a, a proper floor room rug. Um, but again, I'm calling this bridge party. I really like it. 700 is a great price for this. Great color changes. Um, pretty even fading here. Really interesting dark light border uh, between that kind of tobacco leaf color that Ryan loves and the black. And then bringing that kind of tobacco leaf into the red gives you a weird optical illusion between those two borders. Very different. There's so many like colors, but there's so much contrast too. Whoever did this was really intuitively smart and understood the, the successfulness of a play between organic shapes, round shapes, flower shape, uh, and strong geometrics. And they also understood about directional hooking. I don't think that they did directional hooking to be fancy. I think they did it because they realized it was the fastest way to get the rug done. So running pretty straight lines throughout, uh, with the exception of those four corners, uh, that really make a great exception because they're so round and delicious and the color changes that are happening in them, so unexpected and not uniform. But I just love the way that it goes top to bottom again in the center, a little bit different. It's just a smart rug. Uh, it's very contemporary, but it still has that great antique feel to it. It's very colorful. It's simple. It's a really lovely rug. So 700 I think, was a good price for that. That is encouraging. Again, I have a feeling it's a large rug, and if it's a really large rug, then 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 it was a bargain. This is another one, still Pook and Pook auction that ended last week. American hooked rug with sheep dated 1900. So we have a date on this. This is a rug that we've seen before, and I I don't want to. I feel like it's an Edward Sands frost pattern. I'm not 100% sure, but I know that we have seen this sheet before in many compositions. I feel like it was inside a border that they have only partly articulated. I've, you can see the sort of bones of the border. It's almost like looking at a fossil around the edges. It's almost like in two of the corners, they got going with it and then they thought, yeah, this isn't for me. And they kind of left off on the real details that were present in that ornate border. Um, and instead they focused on, well, breaking up the background into four quarters, which I think is absolutely brilliant that nice sturdy body of the sheep. But the expression on the sheep's face is just a to die for thing. Uh, the estimate on this was between five and 800. Um, if you wanna put a guess, put in a guess quick. Um, the expression on the sheep is what is gonna do it for this rug because he's staring straight at us in such a challenging way. He reminds me of Igor from Young Frankenstein, remember? Um, who was that? Marty, Marty Feldman, right? Uh, with like the one big eye and then the smaller normal eye, but it is almost a human expression looking at us. It's very challenging. Nice round shape to the body. Really, really lovely rug, lovely colors, marble cake background. You can see a lot of the thought process in this rug. And when you do, you know you're looking at a valuable rug. I think this rug sold too low. Estimate between five and 800, it sold for 750. 
that is a good number. That's not nothing. But I, f I feel like this rug is more like a $1,300, $1,500 rug. I really do. There's so much different stuff going on in it. And while I'm looking at it, I just know how the maker felt. And I can see where, I'm guessing it's a she, made decisions to abort mission, to move on, to do different things. She realized that she was very good at the graphic part of it, and that's where she wanted to stay. So she created this graphic grid in the background. It's a very small detail, but for me it's important because it's so different. She balanced that diagonal. Remember the rug we saw with the two hearts and the two leaves? They weren't balanced diagonally. Diagonal balance is kind of a built-in instinct thing when, when you have a pretty strong design sense, right? For this person, that was that was the instinct, to go diagonal, two diagonal lights, two diagonal tobacco color. But the shape of the body is so tidy, it's so sturdy, it's so round, and the little bit of shadowing, that little bit of dark, even lifting that one, that one front hoof up a little bit gives so much movement to the piece. I think 750 was a real bargain for this piece. So, oh, let me show you a little close-up of that, the back legs. It's just an exquisite example. And in a subject that I think most people would be really attracted to, that's why I'm surprised that it didn't go higher. But, you know, surprise, surprise, right? This is one of the ones I did for tonight, too. I forget what I called this piece. I think I called it Ginger Jar Spray, something like that. Um, nice, simple piece, early 20th century. I would push that, uh, I would push that into the teens or 20s. American Hook Drug, early, okay, so it is early or mid-century. Yeah, I would say we're pushing more toward the deco period because of the shape of the vase, this classic de deco-shaped vase, but also the droop of the flowers, the positioning, um, the fanning out of the stems, uh, the really sort of manufactured placement of each flower, and the thoughtful color changes, the thoughtful uh, placement of the leaves, bent leaves too, right? We see that kind of Japanese influence when we're seeing like the bent leaves and floral arrangements. Um, and then, of course, the blue jar is very deco period. Uh, also, the series of borders and the use of white. So uh, a lot of things about this are modern in the true sense of modern, meaning early 20th century. So this piece was estimated at Love the Case and the Whimsical Flowers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it is different, isn't it? This is, again, one of these rugs that reminds me of Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot, right? It's just that era of design. Very, very simple, very stark, very um, um, successful, very statement, right? So this one estimate between 300 and 400, it went for 425. So it went over the top of the largest estimate. Um, and I think the reason it didn't go, I, I, I have a couple theories about why I think it didn't go higher. One of the things that's happening in this rug, you can see in the close-up, unlike the rugs that we've seen thus far, there is an attempt at some kind of uniform hooking, right? Really, really, really a strong, I mean, it's more than an attempt. Uh, it is, it is, it's got directional hooking, it's got a strong flow, it's very geometric, it's very tidy. I just want to remind you that Pearl McGowan started teaching and working in the 1920s. So she will go on to form her empire and to teach a lot of other teachers. Um, this is the moment in rug hooking history where we are looking at technique for the first time. So it's not surprising to find a rug that at first glance looks like, oh, that's a bit of art deco fun. And then, you know, th this, is, this is the, oh, it's a bit of art deco fun. And then when you get closer to it, it's like, oh, okay, somebody was going for the gold here. And they really were. There was a real, uh, p the person who made this was thinking about technique in a huge way. That in itself has value for me because it says to me, look at this moment in time. This was just starting to happen at this moment in time. This could be, this could be one of the earliest drugs that represent this moment where people are thinking about technique over uh flow, feel, atmosphere, personality, right? This is a major departure from the past. I think one of the things that is holding this rug back is that this light background, while it is the ultimate deco era color, the white, and so unexpected until this time, white is not a good lasting color for a rug, is it? Because you end up getting a rug that is fundamentally and permanently dirty. 
and in and to a certain extent who cares but when it's white you do obviously notice that more um, all the little problems so from a distance you're always going to be at least even if you're five feet like I am whether it's on the floor or the wall you're probably not going to spend a lot of time closer than five feet to it so in that regard you're safe but rugs that have these light colors do tend to get tinged and dirtier than other rugs just the nature of the color so I think that has potential to hold a rug like this back while I feel that the plus side of this rug is this attempt at directional hooking this is the new way if your neighbor came over and you were working on this rug they would be looking looking over your shoulder um, with envy thinking how are you doing that how I do higgledy pigs how are you doing that Right. So this would have been a great moment in time for rug hooking history. It's exciting to think about this change happening. It happened right here at this rug. So that in itself, I think, is interesting. Let's look at another one. This is uh, an American hooked rug late 19th century. Now, um, this is another great subject. You cannot go wrong with a rug that has a compote of fruit in it. You just can't. Uh, in terms of subjects, I don't think that there is a better subject, really. I mean, some animals some animals are good. Compote of fruit is always going to be good. So this is a 19th century rug. It's an old rug. Not only does it have the compote of fruit, it has that color-changing background, that a little bit of marble cake here and there where colors ran out. That's just what you want to see if you're a collector. Uh, the, the, the different colors of fruit in the bowl are really good, unusual, rich, lush. There is a floral motif happening too. It's really thoughtful the way that the design is broken down. Around the border and quilt language for you quilters, that's like a cathedral window, isn't it? Each of those squares is like a cathedral window patch. That's exciting. And they're all irregular, which means, you know, they did their best to get it even, but that's, they got what they got. And that's, that's, that's how it landed. Uh, really beautiful, very homemade, very handmade quality to it. The estimate on this one was three to 500. But this one went all the way to 1600, 1600. So I think deservedly so. Um, there is some breaking of the border at the top. I think that is accidental. I don't think that was a design choice. It's not a broken enough border for it to have been a design choice. But it's just another reminder that this is a very folky piece. This is an amateur piece. This is what a collector would want at 1600 really good piece the clumsy shape of the vessel too that's a plus the fact that we're looking at different flowers and the flowers are hooked differently that's another plus it's almost like this could be a tudor rose and a lancaster rose i'm not sure i'm not up on my flowers but sometimes when you get the white rose and the red rose it's the reference to the two english families in the war of the roses right i don't know but they they look like they might fall into that category just as a side thought lots of color changes just an interesting piece, an interesting piece. And 1600 is, is not a small amount, but you can see um, great color changes. There's not, there doesn't seem to be any visual, uh, visible damage here. It's just a gorgeous piece. I thought the border was thread spool. Oh, interesting. Let me look back at that. Spool is another good quilty block. Um, yeah, you know, it could be spool, absolutely. Let me think this through for a minute. Wait a minute. I'm going to need clarity on this. It could actually, um, no, I think it's, I think it's cathedral window. And the reason I say that, hold on one second. Let me work this out because this is going to wake me up in the middle of the night. You know what I'm like. I got problems. So I think spool, um, I like to do quilting talk too. You know, I'm going to do more and more with quilting as time goes on just for variety. So these two quilt blocks are real traditional. Spool is a pieced block meaning it's not an applique block. If I was gonna do a spool block here, it would look like this. Right? But it would be, the spool would be the way that you colored it. Right, and then this is the spool in the center. Whereas the cathedral window is, is, not, is neither an applique block nor a pieced block, it's a cut block, where you're literally pulling the fabric back. Um, you're cutting it and pulling it back to create what look like almost three-dimensional swags around the edge. So a little bit different. I mean, who knows what the maker was thinking? It could easily, it could easily be either. This one has, it could be spool, but it has more of the shape of the valance swag. It's hard to tell. I don't even know if cathedral window or spool were blocks in the late 19th century. I don't know. 
I want to know. That's maybe something I should be researching. My mom says, I love that compote of fruit, fruit great borders, florals, uh, and then the dark corners. Yeah, mysterious. It is mysterious. It's very shape-driven, isn't it? Um, really, and it's very amateur. And again, that is something that collectors want. You want the good colors, you want the decent condition, and you want um, a subject that that is palatable. Um, subject is what holds back most great pieces of art from years gone by. Now, these are from different auctions. So th these are this is still Pook and Pook, but I'm, I went way back in their catalog to January of 2014. And I just have single shots of these to bring us to the end of the show because these are ones that I hadn't seen yet. So this is one of, obviously, a, a, this is taken, I have seen this one as an advertisement. Um, I don't think that this is a 19, it, it could be a late, late, late 19th century rug. I saw this, I know I've seen this um, image as an advertisement for, I want to say, like, some kind of soap, borax, something like that. Um, tell me if you recognize it. It's a child riding on a Bernie's mountain dog. But I know I've seen it in a, a very old advertisement. I don't know if it's Victorian old or if it's like early 20th century old. It certainly looks the age of the rug. Um, it does look like a cowgirl. It's it's more like a restoration era little boy, I think, on the dog. It's, it's definitely taken from a famous source. It could be just something... Um, that somebody saw and obviously copied. They definitely did that. It's not an original idea, but I don't think it's a commercial pattern either. I think somebody copied it from something they saw in a magazine or in a print, um, possibly a book, but I think a print. Um, beautiful border, very simple border. So this says to me, this person saw this image, loved the child riding on the mountain dog, w copied it as best they could, and realized they needed something in the border, <clears throat> but they were not necessarily amazing artists, and they did a very, very simple floral border. It is a lovely border. For me, the relationship between this center image and the border, there isn't a very strong connection there, but it's just placement, isn't it? It's just filling up space. So I think that's interesting. Um, it's definitely an interesting rug. The color changes. There is directional hooking, and we only know that because of the way the color changes happen. Um, it's very different because the floral border that is obviously added just to kind of enhance the prestige, which is that centerpiece that they obviously labored over, that is very well done. The side border is much more graphic and very much in contrast style-wise to the central motif. Interesting, creates interest. This piece sold in January of 2014 for $850. So, you know, um, that, that's a good price. That prices were a little bit higher back then. So it's not like it was a phenomenal amount of money, but it's not like it was um, a paltry sum either. Same auction, January 2014. The rest of the images are going to be from the January 2014 Pook and Pook auction. This is another very simple one-off rug. This is called an early 20th century rug. I would be tempted to say this was more. This is more of a late 19th century rug for me. Um, hard to say. So many weird things happening here. I love it that the dog being super offset is so curious. Like he's, I don't know if it has meaning, like maybe he's passed away or he's about to. The upside down hearts might be houses. I'm not sure. I don't know the symbolism of those red dit dots on the corners of the triangles. There might be all kinds of symbolism here. We might be teetering on cultural symbolism that I'm not reading at all. Um, or it could be something as simple as the person meant to put two dogs or three dogs and they realized the dog was hard and decided one was enough. It's hard to know. That makes this great folk art. Um, very, very unusual piece. Another striking graphic piece, something that this person did very well was alternating light and dark. That is something that came very natural to them. Um, beautiful directional hooking. They probably hooked up quite fast. They must have been very pleased with that, and they got very artistic with those hearts and triangles. It might be that they meant to do a repeat of those on the bottom. Uh, who knows why it happened this way? Could be one person started and another person finished. Any number of scenarios might have played out. This one sold for $330. So again, 2014. It is a lovely rug. I think the mysterious question marks that it poses are worth $330. It is a beautiful piece of wall art, isn't it? I mean, I can't, I, I would want this rug just because I could put it anywhere. 
and it would really hold. Any colors, any style of decorating, it would really hold. This is um, a New England drug, recumbent dog, um, and this is one of the ones that I did up and is in ribbon candy hooking if you want this one there. I think I called this one Midnight Pup just because he was like, I said to Joss, what's a good what's a good name for a dog that's like colored a dark color? And she said Midnight. So I did Midnight Pup. It's in there. But Marble Cake Background, I think for me, this, this rug is just fantastic. The expression on the dog, the sweet softness of the dog, the tips of color are a bit unexpected. Um, the placement of the paws, very good, very natural. Um, I love the marble cake background, more lights than darks, interesting. It's all interesting, good handling of silhouettes, of lines uh, to show definition, break down the dog's body in the necessary places, not too many. He doesn't look like a rag bag of wrinkles. He, it's, he's very stately, very um, artistic looking dog but still very friendly and sweet. Those nice round eyes. The muzzle is very nice too. The red is confusing because I think that's meant to be the mouth. Um, I think it would have been better even without that color change. I'd be tempted to hook that without a color change there. I think just the eyes and the muzzle is enough without that ring underneath it. Um, that is in the pattern because of course that is in the rug, but you decide how you're gonna handle that if you hook it. I just love this piece. Somebody else loved this piece because this sold for $900. Um, but again, animal pieces, dog pieces, those are strong subjects. So people will always want those. I just think it's an extraordinary, very folky piece, isn't it? And it's another piece that has contemporary appeal. Same auction in 2014, there were a handful of Hutchinson rugs, James and Mercedes Hutchinson. This is one, um, I'm not gonna be able to read it. Maybe you can read it better. Uh, this is one of these like uh, poking fun, like must I cook for the in-laws kind of subject. It says, what does it say? Out of my kitchen, what do I see? Relatives walking two by three so they can eat more heartily. So here come the, um, I can't read the top part, but here come the relatives looking for their free food, right? Looking, chasing, chasing that free meal, including the pets. Really funny theatrical curtains, nice text, very Hutchinson rug. We know the Hutchinson rugs are very desirable. This is extremely faded, but still a really great subject. This one sold for $700, which is very low. I think at that point, we were just starting to get, you know, the Joel and Kate Cop book had come out in the 1970s, which is obviously way before 2014, but it has taken us quite a few decades um, to, to sort of absorb and start following the trajectory of, of collectible hooked rugs because it's a relatively new thing. It's not like quilts that have been collectible for many, many years. Um, people are just starting to get into, uh, you know, over, over decades of hooked rug collecting. And it's a new game relatively. So talking about the Hutchinson rugs, you go back 10 years, m many uh, people who now love the Hutchinson since have never heard of them. You go, you go back even more years, nobody had heard of them except really high-end collectors, right, who had been already studying in this area. Somebody just showing up at an auction, they're not going to know that name. So a little ways back, we were looking at better deals on Hutchinson rugs, and this is certainly one of them. Color loss is a problem here, but you still have got the text and you've got the joke. So that part is, is good. This is another Hutchinson rug. Somehow these... Um, the subjects with the sailors are, are always very collectible. Um, a deep water sailor through storm and strife gladly protects you his with his life, but should call domesticity, but should calm domesticity prevail, he'll weigh the anchor and hoist a sail. So he's out of there. And she's crying with a tissue in her hand. These are so um, brutal, aren't they? They're just so brutal, the jokes. But it is of that time, isn't it? So this is a more desirable Hutchinson rug because I think of the subject, the, the romantic um, joke, but also the sailor. All of the sailor, the sea, the firemen, there are some sort of niches of Hutchinson rugs that are very collectible and always fetch a quite high price. This one did. Whereas the other one sold for 700 This one sold for 28 Hundred. Of course, this was this is in great condition, right? It's got the joke, it's got the movement. There's uh, even the picture of the sailor behind her, like she's just going to sit and wallow, God forbid, uh, while he takes off and hoists the sail. Uh, awful sentiment, but beautiful rug. Now, this is my favorite uh, Hutchinson rug that I've seen, and I don't know the age on this rug. I don't completely trust this rug. Um, I, do, I really have no reason to not, other than the colors are so 
fantastic. And I don't mean the color um, having lasted. And I don't mean that it's marble cake because they are known for their marble cake backing. But I don't see Hutchinson rugs that have like rainbow marble cake backing. And I don't see Hutchinson rugs that have so many colors in the same shape. For example, her dress, right? Or like the flowers. I don't, you don't really see that in Hutchinson rugs. It makes me wonder if it is later, but probably not. Probably not. I just have a suspicious mind, I guess. This is just the most colorful Hutchinson rug that I've seen. Um, it's also so well done. Like, I mean, I know different people hooked the Hutchinson rugs. It wasn't like the Hutchinsons were sitting around hooking them. But whoever hooked this one, the faces are excellent. You know, they're, they're supposed to be silhouette. They're supposed to be graphic. It's just a suggestion. They're not supposed to be fine art and painterly. Uh, but these are really exceptionally good faces. Uh, just the movement of the body, everything about it. But the colorful hooking is so different for me that I don't know enough about the Hutchinsons. It might be down to the maker, but this piece is called the elopement. This is one of their most famous designs. I've seen some contemporary um, examples of this design hooked in like antique stores and stuff. Kind of inclined to get it next time I see it. I, I, I know one store that has one on Cape Cod, um, but I just love it. I just, I love the subject. I love the rug and I really love this rug. Um, because it, it is so colorful and just the, the color variation goes right through the rug. It's not like it's blocked out in color. It's rainbow right throughout. It's very different, very different. Richard says, I'm sorry, Ryan says, top, uh, top said, top said, oh, top said, must I always cook for my husband's kin out? Must I always hook? Let me go back to it. I know what you're saying, that banner that I couldn't read interesting you are good ryan how did you get that you must have put it under some weird filter or something maybe it's just must i always cook for my husband's kin oh okay and then out is the next line i gotcha i gotcha thank you you, you know it, it, there are so many in-law jokes in hutchinson you know their their catalog of work their patterns in-laws was one of their great subjects too poking fun at in-laws it just makes you wonder where could where could you use the rug once you bought it and the in-laws are visiting maybe that was the thing some kind of passive aggressive um welcome match you know when when the in-laws arrived you have a mat like that down that would have been kind of hilarious actually also a bit mean right all right let me see where did i oops wait a minute wait a minute i'm gonna kind of jet through now so we just saw elopement and okay, other ones from 2014, I'm gonna kind of race through. This is one that was auctioned again, January, 2014. At, this was, all it said was after Matisse. So year unknown, maker unknown, after Matisse. We know Matisse was painting in this style in the early 20th century. Beautiful marble cake body, almost like, uh, looks like wood, but more like stone statue finish to it. Crazy collection of flowers and birds around the edge. Really different, very, very different. It really. Uh, is a great hat tip to Matisse's patterning, his flat patterning. Um, but the, the handling of the woman, the model, is very different. I mean, she's very, very colorful. Lots of patterned wool. It's very different. It is an excellent piece. It sold for $700. Um, to me, this is a very valuable piece. This is one that I would want any day. Um, it, it's just, ex it's an extraordinary piece. It's very weird. It's not like it makes me feel completely comfortable or cozy. Um, but there's so much um, contrast here between the flatness and the sculptural quality of the woman. And it's so different that it really, really appeals to me. I love her body as well. I just love her body. She's got that thing they keep talking about. Uh, men, do your earmuffs right now because you don't want to hear this. On Facebook, I keep seeing this term menopause apron. And it's one of these things like, oh, my God, because you know what age I am. This is the classic menopause apron right here. Sorry, guys. That's just that's just the way it is. Now, this is another one from the same auction, January 2014. It's It was described as a family piece, and it was from the Barbara Johnson collection. Remember the episodes we did on Barbara Johnson, her collection of hooked rugs, many of them Hutchinson's, all of them important? I would guess this is a Hutchinson rug, um, but for whatever reason, it's not attributed. It certainly looks to me like a Hutchinson rug. It does not have text. It does not have to have text to be a Hutchinson rug. The scallop patterning around the edge that looks like a valentine, the costume on the man with a kind of long split tail coat, uh, the, the patterning on the woman, which is a much earlier period of costume, um, all Hutchinson. The hairstyle on the man, these are all Hutchinson. 
I, what's fading away is there seems to be like an angel or something on her shoulder. It seems to be one of these stories where maybe the angel's saying to her, don't do it. You're going to get yourself in trouble. And he's saying, like, come on, honey, kind of thing. Um, there is some kind of storytelling quality that I think is lost because the rug is so faded. But, I mean, I would be shocked if this was not a Hutchinson rug. But for whatever reason, it was not attributed. It could not be attributed. Who knows? But it sold for $300. And whoever got it has got a real bargain because, yes, it has stains. Yes, it's very different. Uh, yes, it's not attributed. But it sure looks like a Hutchinson rug. And it's a beautiful standalone piece regardless. For $300, come on. Beautiful rug. And then some other ones that came out of the same auction that were just striking. This is like just ducks on a pond, a repeat duck thing. Think about cutting out that stencil from a piece of newspaper and just repeating it. Just a couple of horizon lines, one, two, bang, one, two, three, four borders, done. Absolutely beautiful. Again, those red eyes, right? That red glow in the eyes. We see a lot of antique rugs with red eyes. A lot of color fading here, but that beautiful soft round shape of the duck, same exact shape. Um, there is such beauty in the way that they kind of mirror each other, uh, like little partners out there on this kind of purple tossed wave, water, ocean, whatever it is. It is so beautiful. It is such a calm, beautiful, very, very graphic, very simple piece, very modern piece. Absolutely beautiful. This sold for $125. That is very low, uh, very, very low. This is another one that went crazy low at 125. This is uh, parrots, parrots perched in a tree. I don't know what to say about this piece other than it's it does it strikes you as one of these Jacobian cruel pieces, but it's obviously not. It's a little bit older than that. I'd put this right at Art Deco period. I think the person who did this. Um, I don't think that this. I, I don't know. It could easily be a commercial pattern. I don't recognize it. Um, it could be that this person was looking at a mural or a piece of wallpaper. This looks more to me like wallpaper than anything else. We have a bunch more to do, so I'm probably going to carry these over to our, our Coffee Time episode. I'm going to end on this one because I am drooping a little bit myself. Um, but this is a curious one to me. Maybe I'll research it over the weekend. It does have those Jacobian flowers, doesn't it, with those cross-hatched centers. Uh, yeah, the parrots are over the top. Fantastic. Parrots really come in in like the 1910s, 1920s as a design motif. People love the exotic birds. Parrots are the main ones that we see pictured again and again. Um, this would fit for that deco era, that very age, uh, age of sort of theatrical design where you see these kinds of things. You know, you could go to the theater and see this kind of thing painted on the drop cloth that's like down in front of the theater before they um, really open up the house and they start uh, the show up. Right? You get a lot of like painted cloths in those kinds of settings. Um, you get a lot of murals at this, at this time uh, in restaurants, in hotels. I mean, it's just an extraordinary piece. I'd love to know what it's from. I, it could be that the person imagined this piece, um, but it seems much more likely that it's, they were looking at something and copying something unless it is indeed a commercial pattern. If, if it is, I would love to find that out. It's very hard to research without having a name. There's not a great starting point here. It does not hold well as that classic cruel or Jacobian tree because the, the thing that's really absent is the strong trunk, isn't it? All of those designs work off of a strong trunk. This doesn't have a strong trunk. There's this weird twisting uh, triple trunk at the bottom that resolves itself in some kind of a star flower that's the shape of a snowflake. And then it, it opens up, you know, into two equal arms. And that design-wise is not a great idea. And yet it has worked beautifully. They've created like two levels where they can perch the birds and the different styles of flowers. Look at the black outlining in this piece, all of those curly cues and swirls that are happening. Look at the different colors of the leaves. Look at the different colors of the ground. Now that is very Jacobian to break up all of that ground into shelves or layers, almost like a lamb's tongue, but much more uh, landscape oriented. And all of these split flowers and split leaves coming off of them. Split meaning you have a leaf, half of it is spearmint, half of it is evergreen color. color. Uh, really popular thing to do at this time. This is a real mystery, a real curiosity. 
I would love to find more out about this. If you find anything out about this, please let me know. There is something about this color palette that is just killing me in the best way. These cool pistachio mint greens, this very, very light blue green teal, very light teal, very light turquoise. The poison, the pop is the scarlet red, got a little bit of orange, but look at that border, that deep, deep, rich, warm brown in contrast to the background, which is that much more ash colored brown, right? Those two browns are so different. They almost don't seem like they both could be brown going right out to the black. A lot of black outlining happening here. It's just, oh God, it's such a good piece, isn't it? It's making me crazy. It's making me sniffle too. I must be, I must be ready to wind it down, but it is time we went right to nine. So, um, so let's continue this on, um, you know, I just have to give you a sneak peek because I want to show you what I'm going to be working on. I'm going to, I'm teaching tomorrow and then I'm going to Pierre Sylvain's thing on Sunday. And then I hope to do a corn maze on Monday. So I will not run a show on Monday. We're going to have our, our week uh, a little bit different again this coming week. So why don't we say for next week, I'm going to run a show on, um, with the holiday weekend, I really want to do the corn maze with the kids on Monday. So I'm going to run a show. Uh, Kirsten is going to run the Zoom chat on Tuesday, as always. I will run a show on Wednesday and on Friday. Because um, running it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for me lately has been intense. And I just have not been able to recover my health. You can hear me still sniffling and I have a terrible sore throat still. I know I should get tested and all that stuff again, and I probably will. But um, I'm definitely on the mend. It's just been a lot, you know. So why don't we return to this conversation on Wednesday, and we will wrap this up, and we will start looking at the new um, Atha. But in the meantime, I just want to show you what I'm going to be working on, because one of the rugs I didn't get to tonight is, and we'll do this, we'll start with this next week, this beautiful web, right? So I did this as a design also for ribbon candy hooking. This is what I'm going to be working on. Yes, uh, Zoom virtual hooking Tuesday. And if I'm actually sitting down hooking, I will join you. I always want to, but sometimes life carries me really far away. Oh, Dave, getting a Tim Burton creepy yet <laughs> fun. Totally, totally. A lot of these tonight have had a bit of a Tim Burton. Certainly this one does, right? I'm going to be working on this because to me, this is the ultimate um, Halloween hit or miss. I'm going to be working on this kind of on a smaller scale, maybe like uh, 14 or 15 by 12, something like that. It's probably a little bit more stretched than that, a little bit bigger than that. But I'm going to work on it as a small mat size, and I'm doing it as a hit or miss with the black and with a ton of mixed colors in between. And I'm going to be putting it out as a kit. At, at, I'm trying to put out some kits at a lower price point for beginners right now because I feel like I haven't done that for a while. I want to be able to reach people who are uh, not wanting to start with a huge expensive kit. This is one that I'm going to put out over the weekend. It's going to be a crazy colored hit or miss with that black edging to it. Um, and I think I will also stick with that red on the edges, but completely different colors on the inside. This is what I'm going to be working on. This is what the pattern looks like on ribbon candy hooking. So Halloween web. Uh, there's another web I'm going to show you next week, but we will come to that. We looked at that many moons ago on a coffee time. That is still available on eBay. Taunting me. Still there taunting me. So anyway, have a great weekend. Um... Yeah, have a great weekend. I'm at ribbancandyhooking at gmail.com. If you need me or if you want me, write to me there. If I don't write back right away, you know that I love your message and I will write back to you. Sometimes I'm crazy, sometimes I'm busy, and sometimes I'm just overwrought, but I always get back there in the end. Uh, I hope I do. So have a great weekend. And again, remember Monday is a holiday. So the the talk, um, the Zoom hook-in uh, virtual will be on Tuesday, and I will be back with you on Wednesday for coffee time. Patreon members, I'm so sorry it took me so long to get your free pattern out this month with a message. I did that last night. Not feeling well for three weeks. Is, it sounds like such a bad excuse, but it's incredible how much it has slowed me down. Finally got that out. So I hope that you enjoyed the pattern that I sent you there. Um, have a great weekend. Happy long weekend, everybody. Um, I will see you Wednesday and you know where to find me. If you need me, think about the prospect of making rugs for that salt box gift store in Niantic, Connecticut. Think about that because I can help you and be the middleman and get you in touch with her, do whatever needs doing. I can even like drive the rugs over or whatever if you want to send, 
we can make it happen if you feel like that could be a nice way to make some money for the holidays kind of thing. I have a lot of rugs I don't need. I, I want to hook more stuff. What am I going to do with my old stuff? This is all stuff to think about. So if you want to send me a message about that, let me know. Otherwise, please look at Ribbon Candy Hooking. See all the new stuff I've been working on. I could really I could really use some orders. It's been a slow season for us so far. I think all of us rug hooking brands, it's been a little bit slow. So look at all the new things that are out there. They're all great, and they are for you, whether you're a beginner or not. You are so welcome. Have a great weekend, and I will see you next week.